<laughs> Firstly, I'd like to say a very warm thank you uh, for inviting me here today. Uh, I love this institution. Uh, I love the University of Melbourne. Uh, it, uh, it, was, it was the place where I grew up, uh, and uh, it gave me so many opportunities that uh, I, I'm absolutely thrilled to be back here and be able to talk to you, so well, thank you very much. I'd also like to uh, thank my sister Mark for coming and uh, two of my colleagues from the Faculty of Business and Economics, uh, Lily, uh, Professors Liliana Bove uh, and Nicola Mead. So they can tell me if I'm wrong. Thank you. <laughs> what I want to do today is I want to talk a little bit about what marketing is uh, and whether that's good or bad, and, but even more so talk about changes in our society and talk about how changes in our society may change the effectiveness of marketing and whether we should worry about marketing in the future uh, rather than worrying about marketing today. So, uh, worrying about what marketers do is not new. Uh, do I have a clicker or should I just uh, use this? So, this is a uh, picture of a book, uh, Some Little Advertising, uh, by a gentleman called uh, Wilson Brian Key in 1974. And, in those days, everyone worried about subliminal advertising. Our uh, market is getting to us and we don't even know about it. Uh, so people used to spend a lot of time looking for the word sex in ice cubes and seeing whether we were secretly being manipulated. I, uh, I didn't start off as a marketer. I actually started off life as a mathematical statistician. And uh, when, the, well, when, when the Postmaster General's department became telecom, my forecasting branch that I was in charge of was moved from uh, being in the telecommunications division to being in the marketing division, and suddenly I was telecom's first market planning director. And I've got to tell you that uh, being in marketing is a hell of a lot more fun than being in mathematical statistics, if you understand. Uh, but I love marketing so much that I tend to get pretty excited. And when I get excited, I start talking very quickly, and when I start talking quickly, one of my colleagues once said, if I spoke any quicker, it would be subliminal advertising. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you, as, if I have more to say, I just talk quicker. I'm going to share with you some thoughts today about uh, what marketing is and does. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I probably don't need it, actually. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, terrific, thank you for that. So what I want to say, suggest is that marketing gets a bad rap. As I moved from mathematical statistics to marketing, one of my sisters, not my sister here today, another one of my sisters said, uh, John, can't you do something a bit more respectful than marketing, like maybe male prostitution or something like that? And uh, I want to talk about why it is that marketing gets a bad rap. So I want to look today about what marketing does and is. I want to look about how the world is changing and think about how that affects the dangers that marketing uh, might impose on our society. And then I want to close by thinking about some of the things that our society should do to maybe uh, make sure that we get the best out of marketing, but hopefully not the worst. So a good place to begin, especially in a university, is to think about what marketing is. The American Marketing Association defines marketing as the activity, set of institutions, processes for creating, communicating, exchanging, delivering value, customers, clients and partners, and society at large. Uh, I think that's an awful definition. I really think it's a bad definition. It means nothing, it's tripe. And so I prefer the definition of Bjorn Short, who says, marketing is the management of the customer-facing activities of the firm. So marketing is about how the firm relates to its publics. It's about understanding the potential customers and trying to meet the needs of those potential customers. Uh, incidentally, is there anyone here who knows Bjorn Shaw? I want to tell you a little story. This is in fact a true story. A lot of what I'm going to tell you today is true. Uh, <laughs> when, when I was young, I was always a little bit shorter than all the other kids. But my parents were terrific. They said, don't worry, John, don't worry, you'll grow, you'll grow. If you look on your mother's side, you've got two uncles, they're both over six foot. If you look on your father's side, you've got an uncle who's about six foot two, you'll grow. So that was pretty reassuring. While I was waiting to go to primary school, I was waiting to grow, but it didn't happen. I got to primary school first. But my parents were good. They said, don't worry, John, don't worry. You look at, you'll grow, you'll grow. You look at your uncles, you'll grow. So all through primary school, I was waiting to grow, but it didn't happen. But that was fine, because then I entered puberty at high school. And of course, everyone grows during puberty, don't they? 
No, not everyone goes through puberty. I didn't grow up during puberty, but my parents were terrific. They said, don't worry, John, don't worry. You'll put on a post-puberty spurt. <laughs> well, I've got a TV then, but anyway, I didn't grow up. And uh, I noticed the fact that my parents have been saying a lot less lately to me. In fact, I think I'm going to grow up. <laughs> and I was sitting in the library at MIT one day, and I was looking at the letters of John Roberts. And in fact, an anagram of John Roberts, if you rearrange the letters of John Roberts, you actually end up with Born Short. <laughs> and not only did my parents name me Born Short, they probably knew I'd stay short. Now, the, 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 relevant, the, the, the relevance of that... <laughs> The, the, the relevance of that, I've got to say it's pretty marginal, uh, the relevance of that is whenever there's someone who I don't know who I should attribute a saying to, I always attribute to my little mate Lauren Shaw. Um, and so marketing, when, when I talk about marketing, what I mean is how the firm relates to its publics, uh, its customers and potential customers and other members of its publics, uh, the customer facing activities of the organisation. Now there are two sorts of people who do that. Uh, there are the qualitative researchers, uh, the psychologists, the sociologists, the anthropologists, uh, and they try and work out what's happening. They try to understand the process of consumers' behaviour so that they can understand. And then there are the quantitative market researchers, who are the statisticians, the economists, the econometricians, and I've given myself away by saying my first degree was in mathematical statistics, and they try and put numbers on things. How many people will buy? How much will they be prepared to buy? When will they enter the market? And though they're the numerical sort. Now, statisticians get a bad rap too. No one believes that statisticians are in any sense normal. Uh, uh, Morris Kendall once said that statisticians are a little bit like mules. Mules don't procreate, horses and asses get together and you end up with a mule. I don't know how you end up with a statistician, uh, but I think that's a bit unfair because you know, when I was young, I used to go out with young women, go to dances, have good fun, make polite conversation. And I know that there are a number of you here today who are going to find that a little bit hard to believe. So I did bring along a picture of myself at a dance, enjoying myself, dancing with a young lady, and making polite conversation. And here I am, dancing with a young lady, and associated with ladies like I'm coming off it occasionally, infrequently, never. You know, you've got to ask yourself, if quantitative marketers get such a bad rap, why was it that I went into quantitative marketing rather than behavioural marketing? Well, I've got a picture. Oh, I don't know what happened there. I've got a picture. You see when it goes away when I click the button. I've got a picture of myself. I've got a, I've got a picture of people doing behavioural marketing, and I've got to tell you, it's not pretty. Oh no, we've we seem to. Have... Uh, I've got a picture of my uh, of, 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 of behavioural marketing action, and I don't know whether you can see it, but here they all are taking their observations, and it's actually worse than it looks. It says, without an experimental treatment, uh, without a, a pre-measurement, it's difficult to tell the effect of an experimental treatment. Eat. Oh, I'm sorry, John. I just need to do a quick um, reboot of this. I'll see if that helps. Now, can you just click on? by the expected effective oh. experiment treatment. Now, this Cincinnati research facility, each subject's natural body scent is being judged prior to the testing of the odor. <laughs> so not only do you have to do this once, you've got to do it twice and then you'll be able to describe the difference. <laughs> if, you, if you still want to know why I went into quantitative marketing, uh, marketing, I don't think there's much I can tell you. So that's what I mean by marketing. And I've got a question for you before we go any Sorry. Uh, 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 yes. uh, I think I've got a question. In fact, can I can't get the screen. What a good I idea. Can. That's it. Should happen less. Uh, I've got a question for you. When you think of marketers, what do you think of? What are some of the words that comes to mind when the general public thinks of marketers? Sorry? Floggers, did you say? Yeah, yeah floggers is good. Ripoff. Rip off. Shonky. Shonky. So these are some good words. Uh, and, and these is, 
words I often get are words like manip bright ideas. Oh, bro, oh, bro, there I like that. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Repetition. So the, the, the reason why I ask this is that marketers, if you look at lists of professions like doctors, lawyers, economists, etc., marketers never really rate that highly. And it's quite interesting to me, you often get words like manipulative, uh, deceptive, uh, lying, and it's quite interesting to me as to why that happens. Um, and I want to share with you why I think it is that markings get, get such a bad rap. This is not new in sentiment. Marketers have never had a particularly good rap. If we look at some historical views of marketing, uh, we've got uh, Plato, for example, who said, in well-ordered states, law keeps and salesmen, but commonly those who are weakest in bodily strength, and therefore of little use for any other benefits. <laughs> Aristotle, retail trade is justly censured because the gain that results is not naturally made, but made at expense ah. by the men. That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. kick row, depending on where you went to school. Yeah. Merchants to become a vulgar because they can no, make no profit except by a certain amount of falsehood. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, even economists, so it seems to me, have no credibility in the 21st century. They've got the cheek to actually have a go at us in marketing. Uh, <laughs> advertising his absentee salesmanship and his emeritricious endeavour in which psychological appeals to fear and shame are developed to bamboozle the public into purchasing essentially worthless packaged goods at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's what I want to teach you to do today. <laughs> now, I happen to believe that my profession is the best profession there is. <laughs> and I'm not explaining why. Um, and I happen to believe it's actually one of the most socially useful professions that there is. And, and again, I want to explain to you why. And so the reason why I believe this is that if there's not a match between what the organisation does and what people want, then you're not going to sell anything. Now, if there isn't this match between the products of the firm and the needs of the customer, you've got to do something about it. Well, there are three possible things you could do about it. The first thing you can do about it is try and manipulate these needs so that the customer does better you. And we see, we see marketers do this all the time. Yeah. We see marketers try to manipulate the customer's needs and say, you know, with the, the first, those of you who remember uh, advertising in the 1956 when TV was first introduced into this country, the Colgate Ring of Confidence, that was all about fear. If you don't use Colgate, you'll be socially rejected and you'll lose all your, your friends. Uh, and so we see marketing manipulating the needs of the customer, and most people would say that's not a socially very useful thing to do. The second thing is we can actually, and so we see this manipulation of the needs, so that the manipulated needs do actually fit the product. The second thing, though, we could do is we could lie. So we could actually pretend that, in fact, our product is meeting the needs of the customer. And again, I think most people would say that's not a socially very useful thing to do. But there is a third alternative. If the products of the firm do not meet the needs of the customer, we can change the products of the firm. And so we could actually change the products, so they do meet the needs of the customer. Now, marketing does all of these. Marketing manipulates customers' needs, marketing lies, and marketing changes what the firm offers to meet the needs. 95% of marketing is about this one. Why? Not because we're nice people, or we are, uh, <laughs> but because it's a hell of a lot easier to understand what people value and to give it to them. And I think that marketing is an incredibly valuable social function to the extent that it actually understands what people value and works out how we can harness the resources of the community and the economy to actually give people what they want. And that's our job. We're professionals in understanding what people value and working out how the community can use its resources to give it to them. Now, that doesn't mean that it's good if in doing that, sometimes we manipulate people, sometimes we lie. We've got to actually try to think about how we stop that happening. But let's not throw the baby out of the bathroom. I fundamentally and honestly can tell you, I believe I'm doing something that's pretty socially useful when I develop methods to understand what people like, value, uh, find rewarding, and help educate the firm as to this is how we might make those needs. But that doesn't mean that we should stop manipulation nor does it mean we should stop lying. So I want to talk about the second bit, uh, even though uh, the third bit is the, the, uh, is, uh, is the one that we see most of. 
So the question then really is when would we expect to see, I mean, if marketing is an aging process and that the easiest way to make the financial dips is to understand what the customer wants and then give it to them, if that's what marketing is primarily about, and I hope you take my word that it is, then the question really is this is surely a fairly balanced exchange. It's not a negative sum game. It's a positive sum game. The consumer gets something. I've got this 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 pointer, uh, and uh, this pointer is something that I, I can see. Keith has really got his eye on it. Quite likes the look of this pointer, and uh, I can buy this pointer at Office Works for, for ten bucks. It's actually worth twenty to Keith. If I sell it to Keith for anything between ten and twenty dollars, we're better off. If I sell it to Keith for for fifteen dollars. I'm better off because I can buy another one for 10. He's better off because it was worth 20 to him and he only has to pay 15. Marketing is about creating positive sum games. And that's a positive sum game. And so surely this looks like a pretty balanced approach. <laughs> Marketing understands what people value and then it tries to work out how we can give it to them. So the consumer gets what we call consumer surplus. Keith's five bucks better off than he would have otherwise been. And I get marginal profit. And I'm five bucks better than I would have been too. So when is it not a good thing for society? Well, I think there are a number of times where we don't see it as being a good thing for society. One is where we have information asymmetry. In other words, I, as the marketer, know something that Keith doesn't know. I send him a car, and I know that it's actually, he'll be lucky if he gets five k's down the road before it breaks down, and he doesn't. Uh, so where we have information asymmetry, marketing has got um, some real dangers of breaking down. That can happen due to complexity, for example, with insurance products, due to dynamics, vice products like gambling, for example, where we slowly get addicted to them, uh, with credence products where we can't tell the quality of the information. You, you go to your doctor. Is she any good? I don't know whether she's any good. So you died. You probably would have died anyway. <laughs> so you get better. You probably would have got better anyway. Is your doctor any good? I don't know whether she's any good. How do you work out whether your doctor's any good? It's what we call a credence product. And so what does she do with the credence product? She puts lots of certificates up on her wall, her fellowship of this, her fellow, to actually give you a cue that actually she's a damn good doctor. So, so marketing has got the danger of not working well if there's information asymmetry. It's got the danger of working well when marketers are allowed to use unethical <laughs> tools or asymmetric power. So uh, unethical tools like high pressure sales or asymmetric power, the union's organized because the market for labour was such that the employers had a lot more power than the employees. So the employees got together and formed unions. And then marketing is also got the ability when it preys on the weak in society. They might be young, the elderly, so it's putting sweets at the counter, for example, uh, for kids. Um, or when there are unpriced externalities. So what I mean by an externality is that there's a price that is being paid, but it's not being paid by the producer, nor is it being paid by the consumer. And so cigarette consumption, for example, there's a price that society pays in terms of the health care costs of smokers that the cigarette company doesn't pick up and nor does the user directly. With coal seam gas, there's a price in terms of uh, climate change that the coal seam gas company doesn't pick up nor does the user of coal seam gas. So there are some times when marketing needs to be regular. There are some times when this matching process where by understanding what people value and giving it to them actually doesn't work. And that's why we have regulatory bodies and that's why we should have regulatory bodies. Mm. But marketing, I think, is an incredibly useful social force. Mm. And uh, as I said, I passionately believe that because I passionately believe that we should be trying to understand what people value according to their own values and helping them achieve those, those values. Now, what I really want to do today is I really want to talk about how the world is changing. Because the world is changing quite dramatically and quite quickly. And I want to say, does that change the value equation, the regulatory bodies like the ACCC that we've got? Does that change them? Well, I think the answer is yes, it does. Uh, and so there's good news. I think it changes them because now we can name and shame companies much more, much more effectively. Uh, Get Up, for example, the grab bag organisation that, uh, which I belong, uh, is, which uh, basically has pretty much stopped three of the major four banks uh, financing Adani, the Adani mine. 
uh, the Carmichael mine in, 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 in Queensland. <coughs> the chairman of Uber in the United States recently resigned from Trump's uh, uh, advisory committee uh, because of uh, public pressure uh, on Uber uh, and user pressure. Uh, so the good news is that naming and shaming is much more likely in today's technology digital sharing society. Uh, social media uh, is, is got immense ability to have pressures. So I don't know whether anyone has seen uh, uh, this uh, video, this social media video, which was made by a guy whose guitar was broken by United Airlines. Uh, well, I apologise for those people who have seen it. I won't play it all because it goes for about four and a half minutes. But I'm certainly going to play the beginning of it. This guy was flying from Chicago to I can't remember where, and Someone said, look out the window, there's someone chucking a guitar around. Some of, some, of, some of the baggage handlers are chucking a guitar around. And this guy said, oh God. So his guitar was smashed and he tried to get recompense and he didn't get very far. Well, he was sufficiently annoyed that he made the following video and posted it. Now, how many views do you think, that's a very professional video, but how many views do you think this homemade video might have got? Yeah, it's up to 16 million so far. Now, if you're united, you're probably actually thinking, you know, we might have made a mistake. Um, so, let me just show you. It is, it is a brilliant video. Have you tested the croak? So, it should, should, should work. We'll, we'll look at about a couple of minutes of it. It's pretty, it's pretty cute.
had 16 million views. Yes. Don't you just hate? How much would you pay to undo that? Uh, and in fact, there's a website called Untied, which of course is another anagram. Untied is an anagram of United. There's a, web, there's a website called Untied.com. And Untied.com is just a website of everyone who hates United Airlines. <laughs> and you can post there if you want to. And so some of the good things are that naming and shaming social media competitors are all ways in which we can now very powerfully try and keep marketers on the straight and narrow. Try to reduce the line uh, and try to reduce some of the manipulation uh, so that we take advantage of the adapting what the firm does uh, to meet the needs of the customer. Um, so for example, when Nutrigrain went from being about the 12th in the market as they ready to its cereal market up to the 6th, up to the 4th, up to the 3rd after wheat mix and cornflakes, Nutrigrain became the third. How did it do that? It did it because only 16% of people rejected Nutrigrain because it was full of sugar. Now, let me explain to you, I've done a, done a lot of work in this category over the years and Kellogg, for example, classifies all of their parents as being one th uh, one of three sorts. So firstly, uh, there are the Democrats. If enough of you kids promise to eat this, I'll buy it, okay? And then there are the compromises. Look, if you kids will just shut up, I'll buy it, okay? <laughs> and, then there are the de and then there are the dictators. I don't care what you kids say, I am not buying it. And of course, the, the, the dictators, they shove wheat picks up, sorry, wheat picks down their kids' throats. And, uh, Kellogg doesn't do as well with those. Well, even the dictators were buying Nutrigrain. Only 16% of them rejected it. Why? It's got just as much sugar as Frosties or Fruit Loops or any of those. No, it hasn't. It hasn't got sugar. It's got energy. And growing kids need energy, don't they? I mean, the energy happens to be in the form of sugar. Uh, but that's really. So Wheat Mix got so sick of this, the fact that they were losing market share to uh, Nutrigrain, that they just had an ad. Yeah, actually, perhaps I should have. Where it started off with orange juice and said, you have a glass of orange juice, you get 8% sugar. You have a, and it kept on going through orange juice, up through uh, chocolate cake, up through, and then finally it got to Nutrigrain, uh, where it's 33% sugar. Uh, and it said, if you think that's a little bit too much of a good thing, maybe you should get back to basics. So we also have competitors. So we've got lots of policing mechanisms to keep people on the straight and narrow, which are more effective today than they ever used to be. But I think there are also some dangers, and I want to, what, how long have I gone? I meant to stop about, what, two? Uh, two? Uh, in about five minutes. Yep, good. <laughs> yep, five minutes. Uh, so, um, some of the troubling things, I think, uh, the, uh, the, the rise of big data, uh, what's called behavioural economics, and I'll talk about all of these in a second, and advances in neuroscience. I want to talk about some of the threats that they uh, might possibly pro, uh, pose to us. So if we think of big data, well, what is big data? Well, uh, the Oxford definition says big data is data for the large size. That's very important. Uh, but it's normal, it comes into a mini collection of data sets that large, is large and complex, also very important. So I went to someone who's a bit of an expert on pretty much everything to see that I could get a better definition and Donald Trump said, big data are huge. <laughs> so what are big data? Big data, it's huge. Um, so that's, that's a technical definition, but I think that... Uh, so when we think about big data, big data are allowing companies to do much better things like uh, cross-selling. Uh, consumers also bought these, tended to buy other vegetables and, and groceries too. Um, and this can have a lot of value to consumers' lives. There's a, a terrific book by a guy called Clive Humby, who started a company called Don Humby, Patricia Dunn was his wife, uh, which Tesco bought. Uh, it created so much value for Tesco, it looked at all of their data and told them who they should sell what to. So when Tesco bought it, how much could a data company be worth? Mm -hmm. Well, Tesco paid a billion dollars for that data, just for the data company. And then Tesco decided maybe it should sell it, and it said it only wanted $5 billion when it sold it. So, 
understanding how much flavor you're creating to consume. It's fantastic. Tesco went from being the fourth player in the British UK uh, grocery market to the top player by far because it understood its customers' needs and it could say, John, you know, you would really like this new product, etc. There's another site called Firefly.com. Firefly.com looked at people's musical tastes and if you rated Buddy Waters, yeah, that's great stuff. Stevie Ray Vaughan, yeah, like that, etc. If you rated all of these things, uh, then it would say, John, give them what you like, but once you've calibrated your taste for this site, you don't want to ever buy any music for any else, because the site knows what you like. It creates a huge amount of value. Uh, and the firm can capture some of that value by making more profits. Customers are better off, the consumers are better off. Uh, but you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, so with the Tesco Club card, it worked pretty well. Uh, but and Obama, for example, used it uh, in his campaign in 2008. Sorry, to uh, this is Business Week in 2009. Sophisticated political market targeting efforts for a few people in surprising ways for Obama, swing voters known as barn raisers, uh, proved pivotal. About three minutes into his inauguration speech, this is the first one, Obama spoke a word never entered in a pres presidential inauguration speech before, data. So we're actually politically and in business, we're using data in interesting ways to understand people better, primarily to meet their needs better. But we can talk a little bit about that. We have to be careful how we do that. So I don't know how many people know about the target and pregnancy uh, story, uh, but uh, a guy went into a Target store in the United States and complained to Target bitterly about the fact that his 14-year-old daughter had been uh, targeted by Target with all sorts of pregnancy gear and uh, maternity gear and all sorts of other stuff. And, and Target was very, very apologetic and apologised and a week later they rang back to apologise again and the guy said, actually, you know, there's been some mistake. Uh, I hadn't realised, uh, but she is pregnant. Uh, <laughs> target knew. How did Target know? Target knew because she'd started using unscented soap, because she'd started buying more cotton buds, because she bought a big bag which could double as a diaper bag. Uh, target could tell that she was pregnant. Now, firstly, it's, I want you to think about whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. And, and should we stop Target knowing about that? If Target does know, just based on her consumption patterns, and if Target does know about that, should they be allowed to do anything yes, about it? Sure. Clearly it's a potential PR disaster. Uh, and the question is, is this bad or good or ethical or anything? So what does Target do today? Target doesn't send that girl a pregnancy, uh, a, a, a catalogue full of pregnancy stuff. It sends her a catalogue full of lots of stuff, including pregnancy stuff. So, oh, if she's not pregnant, I wonder why they put that in there. It's not one of the but if she's pregnant, well, it's all there. But these are, these are interesting social and ethical issues where the answer is not obvious. And the community should be thinking about what they want the answer to. I, I just quickly want to show you a, a, a video clip from the uh, ACLU, the Australian Council, um, sorry, the, the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, which sort of gives you a feel for uh, what could be happening. Sorry, I thought we were going to be good. Mary, may I take your order? Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. This is Mr. Kelly? Yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number is 610 Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for this. What do you mean? So the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you
showing that actually uh, people didn't behave in what the economists called rational ways, made sense to consumers, uh, then economists got around that by redefining their models so that they did uh, behave, explain everything, because economists obviously should know everything, uh, and they started uh, looking at some of these phenomena. So I'll talk about consideration of the National Potato Board in a second, but Dick Thaler, a very nice and terrifically talented economist at the University of Chicago, said, look, Mark and I are down at the beach, and Mark says, look, I'm get, uh, John, I'm going up and I'm going to get some stuff. Do you want me to get anything? I say, yeah, buy me a beer. She says, how much do you want me to pay? Under one scenario, she's going to go past a five-star hotel, and the other scenario, she's going to go past a down at Mouth Kiosk. I, if she's going past a five-star hotel, I say, don't pay more than $5 for it. If she's going past a down-heel kiosk, I say, don't pay more than $2.50 for it. Why? It's the same beer when it comes back to me. Absolutely no. Because I don't want to be robbed by paying five bucks at a bloody kiosk. It's the same product. And so there are a whole stack of heuristics and biases that we have as consumers, which we use to protect ourselves. We're making tens of thousands of decisions every day, and we need shortcuts. And these shortcuts keep us alive. But some of those shortcuts are not what economists would call rational. If markets understand those shortcuts, and if those shortcuts actually don't maximize our welfare, uh, then we clearly have to be careful uh, with some of them. Uh, if we put tuck shop healthy food in a tuck shop, if we put healthy food at eye level, sales of healthy food go up by 30%. Uh, that's pretty impressive if you read the Chanel Tower Gumps. The organ donation rate in Germany is 12%. The organ donation rate in uh, Austria is 99%. Mm. Surely these two countries are pretty much the same, culturally. And yet 12% versus 99%? What the hell is going on there? Well, I'll tell you what's going on there. In Germany, you're an organ donor if you opt in. In Austria, you're, uh, sorry, if you, if you don't, in Austria, you're an organ donor unless you don't opt out. So the only thing that's different is the default. And so we're learning quite a lot in behavioral economics about how we can nudge, as, as Dick Thaler says, how we can nudge the consumer towards better decisions. Uh, and I was going, well, I won't show up, but I was going to show In 2012, uh, Obama actually used uh, Dick Thaler in his re-election team to actually work out what nudges he could use. And actually soon after that he said to me, John, can you come over and get me an appointment with the Prime Minister so that I can come and do the same in Australia? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
So uh, we've got these nudges. To give you an example, uh, this is some work I did some time ago, uh, where I asked people about breakfast cereals and asked them about the breakfast cereals they would not consider. So I would not consider a breakfast cereal that's high in energy. No one said that. Everyone, that's energy is something we need, so everyone's happy to have a breakfast cereal. However, the people who wouldn't have a breakfast cereal that's high in calories or kilojoules is 33%. Now, of course, this is just the measurement for that. This is the unit in which we measure energy. So I'm happy to have energy as long as it's not in the form of calories or kilojoules. <laughs> Let me show you an advertisement. Let me show you an advertisement by the National Potato Board, uh, which I think is pretty cynical, uh, but nonetheless it's still an advertisement. This is the National Potato Board saying, the only problem with potatoes is that they don't have labels. If you did, you'd see how good they are. And the good thing about potatoes is they're really high in energy, and the other good thing is they're really low in calories. Uh, despite the fact this is just the unit in which we measure them. Uh, and so clearly, we've got a little bit of regulatory effort that needs to go on in this area. Now, I am, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, very conscious of the time, so let me just say the last thing that is, is neuroscience. And this is a little bit further down the road, but with neuroscience, uh, I'm doing some work with a, a Melbourne firm called Forthought Research, where we're measuring emotions and trying to work how our emotions affect choice. Uh, there's a huge amount of work being done by firms like Nielsen and other firms in terms of facial coding so that we can work out from your face how you're feeling and how that might affect your future behaviour. Uh, Coke and Pepsi are basically chemically pretty much the same. Uh, and, and if I give you uh, Coke or Pepsi and don't tell you which it is, your brain will light up in exactly the same way. If I give you Coke and tell you what it was, and I give you Coke and don't tell you what it was, it's just a cola, your brain will light up in totally different ways. Physiologically, we react, not just psychologically, physiologically, we react totally differently to different marketing stimulus. And so, uh, as marketers get more and more able to understand consumers' reaction to these products, we have to make sure that they use that understanding to meet those needs better, uh, not to meet some of the, not make some of the heuristics and biases that we use and exploit them in ways to make them worse. So marketing is not a moral profession, uh, but marketing is not an immoral profession either. Marketing is an amoral profession. Marketing is a set of tools that can help us meet the needs of the community better, but we have to make sure that that's the job that it's actually doing. It's got immense potential to it understand what the community values and focus the resources of the organisation to provide. And it's the job of the community, and particularly Ricky Potters, to make sure that it does do that in an effective way. So some of the questions that we need to ask, I think, and these are questions for you, not for me, are basically, do they make activities present a risk? Can we identify that maybe we're being manipulated we don't even know about it? Uh, does regulation run the risk of actually destroying the value that marketing is able to create? What activities and target audiences are most at risk? And what are the tools that we've got to actually channel the efforts of marketing in socially adaptive ways? And of course, a lot of the most manipulative advertising is public advertising. You know, I'm not saying it's not it's wrong, but if you look at manipulative advertising, things like drink driving, the incredibly strong social appeals to fear. And I'm not saying it's justified or not justified, but public advertising actually relies quite a lot on a fear that it was in private advertising would be absolutely school. Yes. So, uh, and I'm not criticising that, but I'm saying the society has to work out what are the rules it wants to take this wonderful, powerful, valuable tool and make sure it's used uh, as a force of good rather than as a, as a way of making a society that we don't like. Thank you very much.